Good morning. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Thanks for joining us this Tuesday. We're going to get started this morning in Washington, where a federal appeals court is set to hear arguments today in the election interference case involving former President Trump. The three-judge panel will hear arguments over Mr. Trump's claim that he is immune from prosecution for his role leading up to the January 6th attack on the Capitol because he was president at the time. Trump is expected to be in attendance at the federal courthouse just blocks from the Capitol. Last August, a federal grand jury indicted Trump on four charges, including conspiracy to defraud the U.S. and conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding. He pleaded not guilty, and the judge who's presiding over the case wants to move forward with a trial beginning in March. For more on what we can expect today, we are joined by NBC News Justice and Intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian and NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Good morning to both of you. Ken, let's begin with you. So last month, the judge denied Trump's motion to dismiss his indictment on presidential immunity. Special counsel Jack Smith and asked the Supreme Court to step in before the appeals court does. That request was denied. So that brings us to today. What can we expect in that courtroom? Good morning, Joe and Savannah. Well, we can expect lengthy and detailed arguments. This is an appellate court, after all. They're grappling with weighty constitutional issues. Now, most legal experts believe Donald Trump's claim here is a long shot, the idea that a former president can't be charged criminally for any conduct. Because, first of all, in order to reach that decision, uh, the, the court would have to decide that, in fact, uh, presidents are immune from any criminal prosecution. And remember, Gerald Ford pardoned Richard Nixon under the assumption that he could be prosecuted after he left office. But then beyond that, the courts would have to find that what Donald Trump was doing to overturn the election were, in fact, presidential acts. And a court has already ruled in the civil context that that was not the case, that what Donald Trump was doing was acting as a politician trying to win an election. He was not acting as the president. So, um, again, a long shot. But what this has the effect of doing is delaying uh, the, this case from going to trial. Uh, presumably after this court rules, it will go up to the Supreme Court. It's not clear how long that will take. And it really puts this March 4th trial date for this case in a bit of jeopardy, guys. Danny, let's bring you in here. Danny, who, by the way, is joining us not just as our legal analyst, but as a proud Michigan crowd. As you will subtly see on his top. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Three Very hours subtle. of sleep, folks. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to have a talk with you bookers. How dare you? This, uh, this morning of all mornings? Oh, my God. Well, we need you. It's a big day. Um, let's talk about Trump's argument here. So he's continuing continuously made the argument that former presidents have absolute immunity from criminal prosecutions for any official acts, you know, while he was actually in that office of the president. His legal team cites a 1982 Supreme Court case, a ruling about presidential immunity in a civil case. Walk us through his case here, how strong you think it is. It's not strong in that it is a real long shot. Here's why. Uh, president Trump needs to argue not that he has absolute immunity for anything and everything he does just by virtue of being in the White House. Instead, there argument is that he does have absolute immunity, but, and these are the magic words I'm going to be looking for today, for conduct that falls within the outer perimeter of his official yeah. acts. Now, that's really magical language there, because it's not saying that it has to be squarely within what a president does. In other words, the language outer perimeter implies it can be a stretch. It can be a long shot, as long as it's somehow related to his presidential duties. And that is the main thrust of their argument. The problem is, in their brief, as I see it, they devoted exactly one page to explaining that what he was doing, what is alleged in the indictment and what Trump says he was doing, fell within his official duties. I think that's going to be the hardest part for Trump and his team to say that, hey, when I'm calling up the Georgia Secretary of State and demanding 11,000 votes for me, I and the president of the United States investigating the integrity of the election. That's where I think the argument uh, weakens considerably. Mm. And that's one of the main reasons Trump has a long shot chance here. So, Ken, we know the appeals court is hearing this case today on an expedited schedule. I mean, just how expedited? What happens next? It's not exactly clear, uh, Joe, but we can assume that this appeals court will turn something around rather quickly. And then the question becomes how long before the Supreme Court takes it up, if the Supreme Court decides to take it up, and then how long before they schedule arguments, and then they make a decision. And all of that weighs on the question of when this case can go to trial. And after all, of, of all the criminal cases against 
former President Trump. This is the one most people believe is most likely to get to trial the quickest, potentially before uh, a lot of votes are cast in the uh, 2024 election. But the longer this drags on, the less likely that is to happen, guys. So, Danny, not only is the Supreme Court expected to be asked to weigh in for uh, here, no matter who wins this, Trump is also planning to ask the Supreme Court to hear his claim that presidential immunity should also apply to any future potential civil suits as it relates to the January 6th attack. Tell us more about that and what you think the chances are there. He's not likely to win, but his chances are much, much stronger in arguing civil immunity. And that's not me saying that. That is literally Jack Smith and the government prosecution team in their brief. They essentially concede, look, Civil immunity, maybe. Criminal immunity, definitely not. And there really is precedent for that. I mean, what we know about presidential immunity at this point, we know it exists, but we don't fully know the contours of presidential immunity. And that's because it's hard to forecast everything a president might do and everything mm. that uh, the government may seek to hold him responsible for. We do know there are things that a president would be absolutely civilly immune for, and I would argue even criminally immune. For example, every president that has ever sent the military to a hotspot in which a casualty occurred, when somebody, where someone died as a result, no county prosecutor would charge the president with murder. Even though Vincent Bugliosi, a famous prosecutor, wrote an entire book, uh, The Case Against George W. Bush for Murder, based on the Iraq War. So even criminal immunity must exist to some degree for what presidents do. What Jack Smith is arguing really here is that what this president did does not fall within either criminal or civil immunity. That's the main thrust of both the government's argument and the plaintiff's argument. All right. Ken Delaney and Danny Wolverine Savalos, thank you both for joining us this morning, kicking us off this hour. We appreciate it. Congratulations, Danny. We're very happy for you. Well, while Trump is dealing with these legal issues, preparations for the Iowa caucuses are in full swing. The countdown is on. We are now six days from the formal kickoff to the 2024 presidential campaign, and the candidates are ramping up their campaigns in this final stretch. Former President Trump remains the clear front runner heading into the caucuses, according to polls, but his rivals are battling it out for what looks like a race for second place. Former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley is making a major push, hoping to come out ahead of Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. NBC News correspondent Vaughn Hillier joins us from Des Moines, Iowa, with the very latest. Hey, Vaughn, good to see you. So Trump, of course, leaving the campaign trail to appear in court, as we're expecting to hear, see him today, as well as another time this week. Unlike his opponents, Trump doesn't have this full schedule in front of him on the ground in Iowa. Now, we haven't seen any of these legal issues cut into support for him. In fact, maybe the opposite. Are these court appearances as good as any campaign stop for him, given that he's not actually going to be on the ground there in Iowa meeting voters? Absolutely. That's the view from, you know, from Donald Trump's perspective here. These are voluntary appearances. Let's be very clear. Not only the D.C. appearance here today, but also his New York appearance for the closing arguments of the civil fraud trial against him. These are voluntary decisions. So he is making the decision to go into those courtrooms instead of appearing on the campaign trail. And outside of a Fox News town hall on Wednesday night here, he has no campaign rallies until this weekend, right before this upcoming Monday's caucus here. And so for Donald Trump, he has watched ever since last March, that first indictment against him, his polling numbers rise and his lead and margin of lead over these other candidates expand because uh, supporters have, by and large, a great share of the Republican electorate have uh, felt emboldened in their support. I have had numerous conversations just this weekend. I was talking uh, to one, uh, uh, one woman who told me that once those indictments started coming down, you know, yes, she likes of Ron DeSantis, but she felt it was her responsibility to stand by Donald Trump and defend him from these charges that she believes uh, are un uh, without merit, and that Donald Trump is somebody that she believes should get back into the White House and put an end uh, to the what she believes to be political prosecutions. So Trump has gone through this whole campaign so far without a single debate. He won't be at the CNN debate tomorrow night in Iowa. Instead, he's going to take part in a Fox News town hall that's in Iowa. But the CNN debate tomorrow could be a pivotal moment for Haley and DeSantis. So what will we be watching out for? 
Right. Those two have been duking it out for what would be second place here at this point if the polls hold. You know, Donald Trump has been in the state of Iowa just five days over the last uh, month. Well, Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis have been here for about half of the month. And for both of these candidates here, you should see them going toe to toe on that stage. Vivek Ramaswamy, Asa Hutchinson, Chris Christie, they won't be on that stage. And this is the chance for them to make the case to the Republicans that they are the Trump alternative. When you look at polling from state to state, Donald Trump is dominant. But when you start to look ahead to New Hampshire, the second nominating contest that comes on January 23rd, Nikki Haley is starting to see some, some healthy support. And if Ron DeSantis, though, comes in second here in the state of Iowa, there's little reason for him to get out of this race. So this is an opportunity for Nikki Haley to beat Ron DeSantis in the state of Iowa and make the case that the anti-Trump support, if you will, should coalesce around her in order to beat Donald Trump ahead of the convention. Vaughn Hilliard, thank you as always for your reporting. On the Democratic side, polls show that some black voters are turning away from President Biden. So on Monday, he made a direct appeal to them at the site of a racially motivated church shooting. NBC News senior White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez reports from South Carolina. At Charleston's Mother Emanuel AME Church, President Biden honored nine black worshipers massacred in 2015 by a white supremacist. This is a poison throughout our history. It's ripped this nation apart. This has no place in America. The president forcefully trying to link racial violence to the nation's current divisions. That's all right. But his speech briefly right. interrupted by protesters calling for a ceasefire in the Israel Hamas war. Another sign of deep divisions among some Democrats. The president's visit comes as his support among black voters is slipping. In 2020, he carried 92% of that group. But a recent NBC News poll shows just 61% would now choose him over a Republican. Do you think that the Biden administration is taking the black vote for granted? Yes, his staff is. Fletcher Smith worked with the Biden campaign in 2020. Now he says he's very concerned about black voters staying home this November. That administration looks like they don't want the black vote. I mean, you got to speak to the black people. Maurice Washington is a conservative who thinks the president focusing on threats to democracy won't work. It has nothing to do with bringing the country together. We spoke with a group of voters who want the president to do more on student debt relief and police reform. I just feel like it's been a lot of broken promises. I think the main issue for me right now is uh, feeling like I am a priority for the people that are in charge. It's clear based on what the people are asking for, that he's not here to serve us. The Biden campaign insists that the president has taken action on those issues. The question now, will voters give him credit for it? Back to you. All right, Gabe, thank you. Now let's get to the latest round of powerful winter storms hitting across the country. Severe weather is moving through the south, like here in Louisiana, where several areas saw torrential rain and flooding. And the Midwest is being slammed with blizzard conditions. Omaha, Nebraska is just one of the cities that saw several inches of snow and heavy wind. NBC's Maggie Vespa is in hard hit Des Moines, Iowa with more. Hey, Maggie, good morning. Hey, good morning. From a very snowy, as you can see, Des Moines, Iowa, more than four inches falling overnight, close to 10 inches, potentially more expected in certain parts of the state by the time this thing wraps up. And as you can see, this is the kind of snow that it's thick, it's big, huge flakes. It has no problem sticking, meaning this is the kind of snow that has officials and local forecasters worried about things like power outages, road conditions, and several school districts, I should note, have already canceled classes for the day. More broadly, close to 150,000 people across the Midwest and South lost power overnight. Even more broadly than that, 54 million Americans this morning are under winter storm alerts from Texas up into Michigan and parts of New England. And then we're also worried about the wind. 180 million Americans across the country dealing with wind alerts this morning. In some areas yesterday, we saw gusts topping 70 miles per hour. Nebraska was a perfect example. We saw crash after crash after crash yesterday on the highways there, with authorities say at least one being fatal. 
Back here in Iowa, of course, this is also messing with politics. We have less than a week until the Iowa caucuses, and yesterday, presidential candidate Nikki Haley canceled a campaign event due to the snow. And then over the next week or so, we're going to see temperatures plummet. So by the time it gets to the caucuses early next week, we could be in sub-zero territory. And then, of course, guys, just to kind of add to all of this, one more layer. Up in the Northeast, we're seeing really heavy amounts of rain, which when you add that, I don't have to tell you, to the massive amount of snow that you got over the weekend, that has officials really concerned about severe, even possible flash flooding. I'll send it back to you. All right, Maggie, stay warm. Thank you. All right, for more on what we can expect from this storm, let's get a check on your morning news now weather forecast. That means Angie Lastman is here in studio with us with all the details. Hey, Angie, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. Maggie highlighted a, a lot of really important uh, details that we're going to have to deal with over the next 24 to 36 hours. Here's all those alerts. We, yes, have the winter alerts. More than 50 million people included in that. It stretches from the Great Lakes out towards parts of the plains. We've got wind alerts for really almost, uh, you know, nearly 180 million people. And the, much of the eastern quarter of the country is up, is dealing with those flood alerts that have been up since earlier today. 75 million people included in that. But we right now have those severe storms that are uh, have been developing and forming and, and causing some issues for folks along the Gulf Coast. Right now, we do have a couple of tornado warnings in effect. We've got thunderstorm, warming, thunderstorm warnings in effect as this line of some really strong storms works on shore. We already had a confirmed tornado near Santa Rosa Beach, Florida earlier this morning, and we continue to have that threat expand a little farther to the east as the day goes on. Here's the big picture look of the system. It is large, but let's go one by one with those impacts, starting with the severe risk. You can see the enhanced risk, what is in orange right there. Panama City out to Wilmington, down to central Florida. Wind gusts up to 75 miles per hour. We could see some tornadoes, strong tornadoes at that, where you see these kind of red slanted lines. That's where we have the chance to see those larger tornadoes, EF2s or higher, places like Charleston, Wilmington, Columbia, Panama Panama City, all included in that, extending into portions of southern Georgia. But again, that widespread area of red is where we could see that potential through the afternoon and into the evening hours today. Winds are going to be pretty disruptive as well, especially when it comes to travel. We're going to have a lot of rain happening along with those uh, strong winds. 50, 60 mile per hour winds are possible. Check out Atlantic City, Virginia Beach, Cape Hatters. All of those spots could see peak wind gusts over 60 miles per hour. That'll be problematic when it comes to power outages. So heads up for that. And I mentioned the rain will be significant. We have, uh, you know, snow on the ground. Maggie mentioned it. And with rapid snow melt comes river flooding, guys. So this will be something that we watch uh, through the day today and into tomorrow. Could be a difficult commute for a lot of folks. And that's not even the snow that they're going to deal with, uh, right. with the strong winds causing travel disruptions across the Midwest. We've seen these temperatures up and down, up yeah, and down. Yeah. And a big cool down coming down the After line that, and right. another storm system. So it is the we season. Go. All, right. all right, Angie, thank you. Right. Well, now to major developments in the investigation into the Alaska Airlines plane that suffered a mid-flight scare over the weekend. United Airlines says its technicians have discovered some loose bolts involving the same Boeing 737 MAX 9 door plug that blew out of the Alaska Airlines flight. NBC News senior correspondent Tom Costello has the details. United Airlines reports it has found loose bolts in some of its 737 MAX 9 door plugs as both United and Alaska Airlines conduct FAA-ordered inspections on all MAX 9s in the U.S. The NTSB recovered the missing 63-pound door plug that blew out of the side of that Alaska Airlines MAX 9 Friday night, landing in a teacher's backyard. The plug will undergo a close inspection at the NTSB lab in Washington as investigators look at how and why the plane suffered a decompression explosion at 16,000 feet. Alaska, 10,000. While no one was seated in the nearest seats, those seats were left twisted and bent. The headrests and cushions sucked out of the plane, along with clothing and cell phones. Nicholas Hoke was on board the plane. I was starting to text my my girlfriend, my my mom, my other loved ones, and um, didn't know if I was going to make it on the other side. It was uh, a lot of intense emotions, for sure. The door plug that failed is held in place by bolts and pins used to seal an extra emergency exit if airlines don't need it. The NTSB says on three previous flights, pressurization warning lights lit up in the same plane. Yet Alaska only restricted the plane from flying over water to Hawaii until technicians could evaluate the problem.
It's early, but should Alaska have grounded the plane back then? Certainly, it should have it's been a warning sign to them, for just on safety overall. But I think, you know, in this case, uh, what Alaska will say is that they took measures uh, to ensure safety. We have to see whether uh, those actions uh, were responsive or not enough. The plane's fuselage is made for Boeing by Wichita-based Spirit Aerosystems. Spirit said our primary focus is the quality and product integrity of the aircraft structures we deliver. Boeing issued inspection guidelines for every airline that flies the MAX 9. As the FAA reiterated, the MAX 9s will remain grounded until airlines complete enhanced inspections, which include both left and right cabin door exit plugs. That takes four to eight hours each. Corrective actions must be completed before any plane returns to service. Meanwhile, Boeing's CEO has called a company-wide Tuesday meeting to focus on safety. This MAX 9 emergency comes after two fatal MAX 8 crashes that grounded the plane, loose bolts on the MAX rudder system, production and quality control delays with the MAX 8, the 787, military planes, and Boeing's space program. Even an incident like this that doesn't involve any injuries or fatalities does serve to undermine, to some degree, the confidence in Boeing's ability to manufacture a safe aircraft. And there was a problem with one of the black boxes that was recovered. The cockpit voice recorder is on a two-hour loop before it's erased and recorded over. And that's what happened. So investigators can't listen to crew conversations, computer warnings, the air rushing through the cabin. It's a big reason why investigators want 25-hour recordings, not two hours. Back to you. All right, Tom, thank you very much. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is in Israel this morning as U.S. officials push Israeli leaders for a post-war plan in Gaza. Blinken met with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to discuss the offensive in Gaza. He is urging Israel to do more to protect civilians and allow aid into the devastated enclave. More than 23,000 people have been killed, according to local health officials, while the majority of Palestinians in Gaza have now been displaced. NBC News foreign correspondent Josh Letterman joins us now from Tel Aviv. So, Josh, walk us through this morning's round of talks with Israeli leaders. What is Secretary Blinken's message to Netanyahu and, and to his government? Well, Joe, Secretary Blinken met with Prime Minister Netanyahu for about an hour before he joined uh, an Israeli cabinet meeting. Uh, and ahead of his visit, while he was in Qatar, uh, the secretary was really focused on trying to get those hostage negotiations with Hamas back on track. Those talks stalled, according to uh, U.S. officials who have spoken to NBC, uh, after the assassination of that senior Hamas leader in Beirut. Now that he is in Israel, uh, the secretary is really trying to urge uh, Israel to move away from these large-scale attacks in Gaza that have killed so many Palestinian civilians and move into this new phase of the war, a lower-intensity phase that the U.S. has been calling on for some weeks now. And uh, just yesterday, we heard from the IDF spokesman telling The New York Times that Israel is indeed moving into that new phase of the war. And so that may be an indication, Joe, uh, that Israel is trying to signal that it is listening to those increasingly loud calls uh, from the U.S. to do more to limit civilian casualties. Josh, as these talks are happening, we know Israel's continuing its assault on southern Gaza, which is where many of those displaced people moved to from the north. There are reports now that Israeli forces destroyed the biggest residential tower in one of these southern towns, Han Yunus. What's the latest there? Yeah, the southern part of the Gaza Strip, and particularly Khan Yunus, the largest city in southern Gaza, really is the epicenter now of the Israeli military operation there, with Israel saying that in northern Gaza, in Gaza City, which we spent so much talk, time talking about earlier in the war, they have largely completed the dismantling of Hamas's uh, military uh, apparatus and infrastructure there. And so now they are focusing on the south. But the big question is, when will those Gaza civilians uh, from the north who have been pushed into the south be allowed to return to their homes in the north, assuming that they still have homes left to go back to. Uh, so far, Israel uh, has not given any indication of when it will allow people to go uh, back to the north, even as the southern area continues to be under continual and heavy bombardment. And Josh, amid the push by Secretary Blinken to stop the war from spreading, we are seeing renewed fighting between Israel and Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. Also been reports of Israel bombing targets in Syria. What's the latest with all that? 
Yeah, so just in the last few hours, Israel has taken responsibility uh, for killing a senior uh, Hezbollah commander attached to their special forces in an operation uh, yesterday. And today, the cross-border fire has continued, with Hezbollah saying that it targeted Israel's northern command headquarters in Sfat, which is uh, uh, slightly north and east of where I am here in Tel Aviv. Uh, the Israelis say that they responded in turn uh, to the areas in Lebanon from which uh, that drone attack was launched. And so, uh, really, the tensions are continuing to climb, the fears of that broader war, as the Biden administration and Secretary Blinken are trying to get everyone to cool it, trying to use their conversations uh, through back channels with Iran to get Iran to pull back uh, its, its proxy forces, such as Hezbollah. Uh, but right now, there are no signs that this is going to uh, really cool down, with Israel saying that the window for diplomacy to pull back Hezbollah from the border and avert a wider war uh, is soon closing, Joe. All right, Josh, thank you so much. Thanks, Josh. Well, at least 20 people were hurt after a massive explosion in downtown Fort Worth, Texas, blew out the first two floors of an historic high-rise hotel. Take a look here. You can see the destruction left behind from the blast. Investigators say the cause of the explosion at the Sandman Signature Fort Worth Hotel is under investigation. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.